A female stingray at an aquarium in the US has bewildered staff after it was found to be pregnant with no male involvement. The rust-coloured stingray named Charlotte is the size of a dinner plate and has not had male company for eight years. Experts have dismissed theories that the fish might have mated with one of the five small sharks she lives with. Instead, they believe it's a rare type of asexual reproduction. Joni Peeney Fitzsimmons is a research fellow at Charles Darwin University and she joins us now from Darwin. Joni, welcome. So this stingray is in captivity. How often do these stingrays become pregnant when they're alone in the wild? Well, we don't really know uh, because it's a lot easier to see these animals and see this particular phenomenon in captivity because you see a ray that's been alone for a number of years and all of a sudden it's pregnant. How did it happen? Uh, it's a lot easier for us to observe, whereas in the wild, it's far more difficult to, <laughs> to see this kind of thing. But it has been documented uh, once that I'm aware of in a small tooth sawfish, uh, but it is very rare and, uh, and pretty uncommon. Yeah, so this is pretty extraordinary. You're, you're pretty excited about it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, it's only happened a couple of times in my relatively short career, I guess. Um, but it is something that has been documented in, I, th I think, up to about 20 times in, in rays and sharks uh, as a group. So that's quite a high number uh, considering, you know, the, the, what it is. Um, but it is, uh, it is very exciting to, to have it happen again. And so from an evolutionary sense, how is it that these animals are among those which have developed this ability to do this while others can't? Because when you see an image of a ray, it's often in a fever. I just wanted to use that collective noun because I love it. Uh, and uh, yes, they seem such social animals. Yeah, it's 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 really fascinating um, to yeah see it happen again. Um, but it's this particular phenomenon is uh, particularly exciting in, in this group of animals uh, because we believe it is uh, potentially a way for them to, uh, it's like a last ditch effort, I, I guess. Um, and so it's a way that they can keep producing their genes for the next generation in situations where there's low population numbers um, or no limited access to, to males for them to reproduce with. Um, and this is particularly important for sharks and rays because they are one of the most um, highly threatened groups of fishes. Um, and so for them to have this particular ability means that they have another strategy that they can use to try and increase their, their, um, their numbers in the wild. Um, but it's only under those really sort of dire circumstances where those population numbers are really low uh, and there's just limited access to, to males to reproduce with. So explain for us in layman's terms, how does it actually happen? Yeah, well, parthenogenesis is uh, effectively, a, 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 it occurs by the, the female producing an egg as well as these other pieces of genetic material um, at the same time, which normally these other bits of genetic material would get reabsorbed. Uh, but in the case of parthenogenesis, um, as the eggs produce, they actually mould with these other pieces of, of genetics, um, which effectively fertilises an egg that would go unfertilised otherwise. Uh, and then that's what develops into the embryo and then into viable offspring. Yeah. And so is, is sperm involved or not? No, not at all. So there's, there's no um, male DNA uh, that goes into the process at all. Uh, it's all genetics from the mother. Um, it does result in a little bit, they're not exact clones. The pups aren't going to be perfect mimics of the mother. And um, there's a little bit of, of DNA restructuring that goes on in there. Um, but effectively, they'll be pretty closely related to the mother based on purely having her, her genetic material. You mentioned there were 20 cases of this documented, I think, in rays generally. Has, has, is one of them in Australia? Uh, well, it's 20 times in, in Elasma Ranks, the broader group that rays are part of. So that includes sharks and rays. Right. Um, but I believe that it's only been um, documented, I think, in four species of ray. Uh, I can't be sure if, if there, any of those were in Australia, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't have the details. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's, this will be the fifth time. Yeah. So and it's yeah. So it's really cool that this can be observed uh, in the, in this situation too, huh? Yeah, exactly. And that's that's one of the the values of having aquariums and captive areas where we can see and observe these animals because out in the wild, you, there's it, you just don't have the capacity to kind of 
uh, test and, and research uh, this side of things because these animals are so widely distributed. Uh, but when you have them in captivity, you can really observe them quite closely. Uh, and with this ray in particular, they'll be able to monitor the pups to make sure that, that they're happy and healthy once they're born as well. And it looks like she's, she's almost at full term, so we should have uh, those pups arriving very soon, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, cool. And more broadly, how are stingray populations going in Australia? In Australia, we actually have uh, some of the last remaining uh, stronghold populations of a lot of um, ray and shark species, which is excellent. Uh, but more broadly across across the world, they are, as I mentioned before, one of the highly one of the most highly threatened uh, groups of animals. Um, and so we're lucky to have here that uh, we have these populations that we can safeguard, but they do need uh, really critical protection. It takes a lot of work and management to ensure that those populations do stay um, at the levels they are and then also to help their recovery more broadly. Yeah, and we've heard of marine heat waves. Have they been affecting the populations? Uh, it's still it's still sort of early days in terms of that area of research. Um, there's there's a little bit of work going on in that space, but it is uh, it does have potential to cause um, changes in the distribution of the species. So moving uh, polewards, so towards more colder water, um, to find that niche that that they like to live in. Um, but you know a lot of especially for a lot of ray species, they're very closely attached to the coastline. Uh, and once you go to a certain point south in Australia, you kind of run out of coastline, uh, which is also a really important issue um, that, that often gets missed is that there's those spaces that are available will also be shrinking um, as the water temperatures rise and those animals start moving. Joni, I'm kind of, it's in my head now looking at you, uh, for excitedly looking at the latest information on these pups when they're born. I'm re really keen uh, to touch base with you later to chat about how they're going. So thanks so much for having a chat to us. Joni Peeney-Fitzsimmons there from Charles Darwin Uni. Thank you.